Hi everyone, this is Steve Hargadon and welcome to the Future of Education. It is Wednesday, March 17th, 2010. And there may be still a little bit of lag for me, but I'll catch up quickly. We're sure glad to have you here tonight. Our special guests are Bernie Trilling and Charles Fidel. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Good to be here. Thank you. A pleasure. Okay, so you're both on the uh, telephone bridge, so you do want to speak up as much as you can. Future of Education is supported by my day job at Learn Central, uh, part of the Illuminate family. Uh, as Charles has, has joked about it, it, Illuminate is a competitor to uh, the Cisco WebEx product. But we're sure glad to have you here in whatever form. And Learn Central is a social network for educators that combines educational networking and synchronous uh, live uh, discussions through Illuminate. So we hope you come check it out. Coming up on conversations.net and futureofeducation.com. And it looks like Brenda got dropped off. I'm going to bring him back in. Uh, tomorrow, uh, two ed tech investors will talk about the commercial side of educational technology. Next week, Kathy Davidson on the future of thinking. Uh, on March 24th, Education for Digital World 2.0, the series starts. On the 25th, our Classroom 2.0 PBS joint session on their new program, The Buddha. March 24th, Bill Kist on the Social League Network Classroom, David Hill from Merlot, Sir Ken Robinson on the 30th. Lots of other fun stuff coming up, including some new additions, Larry Ferlazzo on April 21st, Tim Magner on April 22nd, and uh, Randy Orwin on April 27th. If you've missed the show, here's a list of the ones that uh, were the, for, for which the recordings are up. You can also go to futureofeducation.com and find the podcast link um, as well and look for these lots of fun shows, hopefully something of value for you. Better than Letterman, yes. <laughs> well, much more geared towards educational technology. If this is your first time at Illuminate, this is a participative environment, and we're sure glad to have you here and hope that you will participate. If the bottom of the participant window, you'll see some emoticons, a smiley face, a clapping hand, a confused look, or a thumbs down. Please feel free to use those. If you would like to ask a question using the microphone, you can click on that larger hand with the up arrow. Uh, do be aware that during the presentation portion that may not be appropriate, but as we get to Q&A, uh, that you can do that. Uh, there are other ways for you to communicate. Obviously, the chat area is one. I recommend that you go up to View Layouts and switch to the wide layout. It gives a much better view of the chat, and it's easier to see what's going on. And now I'm going to give you a chance to participate by letting us know where you're listening from. If you look for the wand with the red star at the end to the left of the map, click on that, then click on the map. Then let's see how international our group is tonight. So Jackie, you and Clay Shirky agree that uh, the, the, uh, these technologies have unleashed our latent desires to participate, and TV is a far second. OK, so it looks like we're North America-centric tonight. We have some folks from Canada. Sure glad to have you here. Feel free to shout out in the chat where you're listening from. And somebody in the Mediterranean Middle East area. You mean former Yugoslavia. Is that where it is? <laughs> yep. So I'm glad you're watching because I don't know who that is, but we're glad to have you here. Okay, so wherever you're listening from or if you're listening to the recording, uh, we, we are delighted to have uh, Bernie and Charles here. Charles and I met actually in person uh, at the COSIN conference just a couple of weeks ago, and that was a pleasure for me. Um, what I'm hoping the two of you will do is uh, first maybe each of you give a brief introduction starting with Bernie of uh, where you are now and what work has brought you there. And then maybe together you could go through the, your slide deck and give us an introduction to the concepts in the book. And I've got some, what I hope are some deep questions for you. Hmm. Looking forward to that. Looks like we lost okay. Bernie Okay, we got again. me kick off? Yeah, although we, it looks like we lost Bernie yeah, again. Yeah, so I'm coming in and out here. So, oh, so you're still on the call. You're just not um, in the session. So uh, I can drive the slides for you if you would like. And um, why, don't you, why don't you start with an introduction? Sure. Okay, well, name is Bernie Trilling, uh, co-author with Charles of 
21st Century Skills, and uh, also the uh, Global Director for the Oracle Education Foundation, um, which is a uh, Oracle Corporation funded uh, 501c3 nonprofit foundation um, that hosts an uh, online project learning environment called ThinkQuest, uh, as well as a number of other professional development and other co competition activities. And uh, Charles and I have been uh, uh, co-chairs of a committee for many, many years with the Partnership for 21st Century Skills, where we uh, have been moving with a whole bunch of other folks, and we'll talk about that later, to uh, see if we can define what success means for the 21st century for students. And that's kind of really the essential question of, uh, of all that, we, that we've been uh, covering, uh, which is what does it take to be successful in the 21st century, given the world that we have, and what, is, uh, what kind of education is necessary in order to prepare uh, students to be successful. Um, so with, uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Charles. Thanks, Bernie. And uh, thank you, Steve. It's uh, always a pleasure. And uh, you know, I've followed your work uh, when you were with COSIN working on uh, open source, and I've always been a fan of all the work you do. So thank you for having us here. Uh, I'm Charles Fadel. I'm Global Lead for Education at Cisco. Um, I basically generate the thought leadership and the research behind it for Cisco in education, uh, particularly related to education transformation worldwide. I interface with a number of governments, and in particular with the OECD nowadays as an organization, as well as, as Bernie mentioned, the P21. I also have a, an active interest in STEM via a, a nationwide group called Innovate Educate, and obviously technology and education. It was my pleasure to be here. So let's move you directly into the slide deck. Bernie, back, back to you. I don't know, Bernie. Or do you run that, or what would what would be your preference? Uh, well, uh, I I would if I could, <laughs> but I'm still trying to authenticate here and get get in back in. So, uh, I, but I uh, I have the deck in front of me, so I will uh, I'll start things off, and uh, I'll just tell you to advance the slide, Charles. You can help out here. Does Charles have um, moderator privileges? He does. So, Charles, there are some arrows just above the slide deck. Uh, you know, left and right in the middle, and then all the way back and all the way forward. But you just need the yep. two in the middle to go left and right. And uh, Bernie, I have the our focus today slide up. Okay, great. All right. So um, there's three things we want to cover today, um, and uh, give you a sense of what, what we believe uh, 21st century learning is all about, and why it's different than 14th century learning or 15th century learning. Um, or even 20th century learning, and then uh, take a, a good look at uh, some of the skills that uh, we believe uh, students are going to need for for success uh, in the 21st uh, century, and uh, and then we'll look at uh, a little bit about a, at least one model uh, of how students can develop those skills well, um, how we can help uh, best help students to acquire those skills. That's kind of the uh, agenda for our, our brief uh, slide presentation, and, and then. We'll be more than happy to to go into a bunch of questions and uh, and uh, delve more into your your questions and be more specific about things. But first, uh, and this is going to be lots of fun, um, we'd we'd like to do a little interactive activity with you uh, first, and this will involve the chat uh, the chat space for all of you. <laughs> and <laughs> this is going to be fun because I can't even see it. Oh, well, I think I'm getting back in. Ah, good, great, I'm back in. All right, so. Here's, here's how the exercise goes. This is to get everybody um, warmed up and plugged in. Imagine you have a kid um, just entering uh, school this year. Um, it could be a, a, your child or a grandchild or a friend's child, but a kid that you care a lot about. And um, they're, they're entering school this year. And the first question that you, I want you to text uh, back, up, back on uh, with short phrases uh, is, what will the world be like 20 years from now when that, when that child that you really love and care about is uh, leaving the education system and going out into the big wide world, what are some of the key phrases uh, of, uh, that would characterize the world 20 years from now? And uh, you can just chat them in um, in the chat box. <laughs> and we will summarize, uh, summarize some of that as you as you do that. And Charles, I think you're going to have to jump in and summarize the commentary here as it goes along because um, I'm jumping in and out of this uh, session. 
Right, while well, streaming very fast, but they're saying, of course, connected, multilingual, mobile, virtual. Good. Visual, completely digital, connected, global, interactive, directed, self-directed, I mean, creative, yep. collaborative, and on and on. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, painting a bit of a picture of, of what the world uh, will be like 20 years from now. Now, given that given that world that you just painted, uh, let's go to the next question, which is uh, what are the uh, essential skills and knowledge and values that uh, that child that you care about is going to have to have to be successful in that world? So again, please uh, participate and text in a few phrases of, of what you think the essential, the core, the most important skills and values and attitudes and knowledge that uh, students are going to need or that, that particular student uh, is going to need after after they leave the education system 20 years from now. Bernie, for levity, you, I, I need to mention there is an answer about uh, the first question saying that we will still have a big truck. So there's someone who believes that oil will not be completely depleted. <laughs> in 20 years. Great. Someone wants to hold on to that big truck. Okay, that's good. All right. Um, all right. Uh, so the answers to your second question are adaptive, motivated, flexible, compassionate, innovative, motivation, innovative, flexible learner, communicate, mm -hmm. collaborate, socially responsible, L learn, unlearn, relearn. Mm -hmm. Somebody's looked at the first page of the book, I think. <laughs> okay. So they bought it on Amazon via eBooks, and they're reading from it. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. Okay. Let's go to the third question then, uh, which is, this is a personal question for all of you and all the participants. Um, think back to a time in your own life when you were deeply, deeply engaged in the learning process. You were really learning uh, and sort of a peak learning experience for your in your life. What were the conditions that supported that uh, really engaged, deep learning experience, that peak learning experience? What were the conditions around that? Again, um, text in your your phrases, and Charles will. Recite them as we go along. So self-directed, joy, problem-based, teacher believing in me, choice, need-based, cognitive dissonance. That's mm. an interesting one. Uh, Tom, you mentioned cognitive dissonance. If you don't mind explaining how and why. Passion, intuitive, desire to want to succeed on my own part, outside of school with my dad. Excitement, hmm. discussion forum with open minds, interactive, feeling connected, dedicated teachers, determined, teacher was a person and leader, and on and on. Lots of really yeah. good answers. Competence, caring teacher, personal value, parental support, teacher challenging our preconceived notions on education. Ah, yes. Oh. the misconceptions. Mm. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. All right. Great, Thanks, everyone. Okay. Well, in in a very short period of time, what we just did was created a blueprint for learning for the 21st century as as a group. And uh, what what you basically said is that the world has changed. The skills that we need are different, and the kinds of conditions that we need uh, to engage in deep learning uh, and uh, deep understanding. Uh, is uh, is different. So the last question really is, what would learning look like? If it was designed around your your answers, uh, and we've done this exercise many times, and the answers are all pretty consistent, uh, and the surprising thing is is the distance between your answers and what goes on every day and every minute in every classroom, or in many classrooms at least. Uh, so this is this is really why um, Charles and I decided to uh, put together a book that would uh, kind of frame. The, uh, the the times that we live in, what what learning is appropriate for the times, and uh, what are the essential skills, and then how do we get them? Now, what, one more question on the on the next slide. Um, out of all the skills that were mentioned, um, one last question here. What do you think is the key 21st century skill, the number one top, you know, mega skill <laughs> necessary to be successful in the 21st century? And if you can uh, if you can text that in, that would be great. So I'm um, seeing critical thinking, communication, lots of C's, innovation, 
to think, creativity, information, flexibility, rethink, collaborate, critical thinking, computer literate, adaptable, passion, ability to adapt, visual fusion. Cool. All right. Excellent, excellent answers. If uh, the next slide will tell us what one person has thought, which is uh, which is learning is what most adults will do in the 21st century. Learning is the uh, is the is the key skill, and uh, all of you out there as uh, educators and involved in education uh, are in the right profession because uh, that is the most important skill of them all. Many of the skills that you mentioned uh, are of course a part of the learning process. Um, so. Uh, you're, in, you're in the right place at the right time. Learning is, a, is the right profession, uh, even, even though it may not feel that way at times. But uh, it, is, it is the calling of this uh, 21st century, and it's going to be what everyone needs in order to succeed uh, to be lifelong learners. Bernie, can I ask a, um, a quick question? So, let's, this is Steve. Sure, please. So you said that, that you typically yep. get very similar responses to these questions. Uh, is that true when your audience is parents as well? Yes, absolutely. I, I've done this with parent groups, educators, a variety of different uh, uh, groups. And I think we all know inside of us, what, especially when it's put in a personal way, what, what our children really need to be successful in the world. Um, probably because you know, we, all of us are involved in jobs in the world, and we, we, we kind of know that uh, the job world is, uh, is pretty much project-oriented uh, in good jobs and, uh, and a lot of other uh, characteristics that need communication and collaboration and critical thinking and all the other skills that were mentioned. So I, I think uh, there's a general consensus uh, among all, all the people that, uh, that I've spoken to that, uh, you know, and there's slight differences, but, but there's a consensus that what, what our students really need right now is much more than the basic skills and, and basic knowledge. Bernie, if I may add, uh, we did a, a survey via heart research at P21 asking a swath of Americans, uh, 1,072 or whatever the poll number was, what they thought about skills. And 88% of Americans consider that skills are important to be taught in, in schools. 88%. I don't think we have that much consensus on just about anything in this country, usually. Yeah. So, uh, so, th so that shows that there's a big uh, a gap, uh, an important gap between what we know kids need and what we're actually doing uh, every minute of every day in schools. Um, and that's the challenge uh, to move forward. Now, a few slides to kind of um, highlight some of the, the shifts and changes that have happened uh, more, more recently um, in this 21st uh, century. Um, this first slide, uh, called 20th Century Tools, uh, shows what, uh, what life was like um, in 1975, uh, some of you may remember that that year, 1975. Can't remember anything particular about that year, but in that, if, if you do, I and I were not born. But and I were not born. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, uh, I happen to remember it. But anyway, uh, the life was simple back then. Uh, you had TV, you had a newspaper, you had radio, uh, a telephone. And not much else. Oh, you might have had even a, a cassette eight track. If anyone can remember what this cassette eight track is all about, and uh, that, that that was the kind of the media ecology of of that time. So shift forward to today, the next slide, and things are much much more complicated. And this slide was way out of date the minute it was it was uh, recorded into the PowerPoint deck. Uh, and, and the connections and the interconnections of ways you can transfer files and music and all kinds of things now on similar devices is really a breakthrough. That's, that's extremely new, that, um, that devices have multiple, multiple uses. Uh, this, is, this is the world uh, that, that we're in today. And that is very, very big change. It's driving a lot of other changes, as, as many of you are extremely familiar with this who are involved in educational technology. Um, also, on the next slide, 21st century learners, um, th our, our, uh, our customers of the education system, our students, are also uh, looking pretty different, and their demands are different. Uh, John Tapscott uh, wrote a long a while back, uh, Growing Up Digital, and he's most recently uh, came out with a, group, a book called Grown Up Digital, in which he studied 11,000 or so, I forget the exact number, um, uh, uh, people uh, aged. Uh, 10 to 31, I believe, in that age range, and asked them, you know, what what they really wanted, 
and what and what they would uh, would desire out of education. And this this was their answers. Uh, they wanted personalized learning. Uh, they wanted speedy access to research and writing tools and project tools online. They wanted to to network. They wanted to socialize. They wanted to be with their friends as when they were learning and collaborate. And they also wanted playfulness, uh, game simulations. They wanted to be able to to create their own expressions of what they were learning. And th this is a, a a pretty big consensus in that in that age group in the net generation uh, group. Whereas uh, Charles uh, has called it the the Homo Zapiens. I thought that was a one of the best. Yeah, that that comes from uh, a research at University of Delft in uh, in Holland. I, I do not claim credit for that. Yeah, I leave it to the Dutch to come up with a really good one. Homo Zapiens. That sounds good in, with an accent too. Yeah. So, so if I may add, Bernie, uh, you know the Ipsos research I sent you from Becta recently, uh, showing that uh, uh, number one, two, and three for kids' preferences were number one, learning as a as a group, with a group. Number two, learning by doing practical things, and I'm underlining both doing and practical things. So the aspect of relevance here mm. is, is important. And third, learning with friends. And then fourth, technology. Whereas very often we think, we tend to think that technology is the thing they want to hear about. But actually, no. They want social learning, number one and number three, doing practical, relevant things, and then technology. Exactly. So lots of studies uh, that are that are indicating uh, all the same thing that the, the net generation, the Homo sapiens, are are demanding something very different than what uh, what. A previous generations uh, wanted. Hey, Bernie. This is Steve. Uh, out, of, out of their learning experience. I thought it was interesting as I went through that part of the book with the expectations for students to know that there may be a temptation to think that students are wanting things that might not be necessarily valuable or necessary, and, and you've sort of addressed that. But I also feel like John Seeley Brown's work, you know, pretty clearly shows the value of those things that they're wanting as well. Absolutely, yeah. And there, there's there's quite a a uh, interesting mashup of uh, of how how we learn and uh, and the research around how we learn, what the the uh, that generation is demanding, and what the affordances are as far as technology and the, and the demands from knowledge work. All those are coming together on a very very similar set, and this is why the the 21st century skills movement is so powerful at the moment. Uh, and is capturing so much interest globally is it's because all these things are coming together on a common common set of learning goals that are will be necessary to to be successful in this world and I think that's that's uh that's a, a unique uh, situation and why it's such a, a big change so so moving on speaking of which um in the next slide um twenty first century world the world is flat uh, as you all know by now thanks to mr Friedman. Um, and knowledge work can be done anywhere if you got a cell phone and a working connection <laughs> and uh, and a, maybe a laptop. Uh, but you need something else, and that's in the next slide, which is all knowledge workers uh, everywhere need need the, these set of skills, these important 21st century skills, in order to compete. It's not enough, as as we just said, to have the technology. You need the skills, and those skills are are learnable. So. Um, in the next slide, there's been a number of studies uh, you might have seen a number of years back, uh, Time Magazine cover story, How to Build a Student for the 21st Century, a book called Tough Choices for Tough Times. Uh, interesting, in the, in the center of the slide, um, a, a study, Are They Really Ready to Work? It was commissioned by the Partnership and a couple other organizations, Conference Board and the rest. And they asked, uh, was it 400 executives? I think something around that. Uh, are students ready to work coming out of high school, coming out of community college, and coming out of four-year colleges? And the answer fundamentally is not really. They were lacking in a number of these uh, skills, some communication skills, uh, some writing skills, uh, some collaboration skills, and teamwork skills. Uh, they, just, they just didn't see them coming out of the education system, confirming the fact that uh, there is a, a, a gap between what we know students uh, need to have to, to be good workers and what, uh, what they're actually coming out of the education system with. Um, uh, there's also, uh, uh, in the next slide, um, I wanted to highlight the fact that uh, there's a, a new uh, a national education technology plan that's just come out. And uh, it is highly, it's calling the 21st century skills um, 21st century uh, competencies 
and um, oh, help me out, Charles. Competencies and what was the other word being used? Um, It'll come to me. Uh, but anyway, uh, so no matter what you call it, it's still the same kind of set of skills and uh, the same uh, um, group of, of uh, competencies that uh, that we've been uh, talking about, and we'll get into a little bit more in a, in a second. Uh, but it's it's a good sign, and also uh, uh, wanted to, wanted to thank the uh, Department of Ed to that included a, a reference to our our work in this uh, National Education Technology Plan, which was which was heartwarming. And in the next slide. Uh, a little bit more about the future of work, uh, the future world of work. Uh, it, it really has uh, has dramatically shifted, and this this is really the future. In addition to having uh, 11 different uh, careers by the time you're 41, uh, it, which is the projection for students now in school, um, those those careers are are uh, are looking a little bit more polarized. There's the the work on the top of the chart, which is uh, mostly the creative work. Uh, research, development, design, marketing, sales, supply chain, a bunch of other uh, job uh, categories that involve uh, really creative work. It's not routine work. Now, the routine work on the bottom of the chart is either done by machines, it's automated, or it's done at the lowest possible um, cost somewhere in the world uh, that has a, uh, a low-cost uh, labor pool that can do that routine work. So there is a real polarization in in uh, in at least the income uh, levels uh, and the possibilities for income levels on the, in this in this chart and the top and bottom of the chart, and so this this really represents a new challenge to the entire education world and literally the world, and that is the job is to as never before to get as many many students as possible up into the top of the chart uh, where there are good paying jobs. Uh, creative work, uh, interesting lifestyle, and a much more challenging life um, on the bottom of the chart. Uh, and, and now, in the next slide, um, this is the organizations that uh, consist of the Partnership for 21st Century Skills. Um, you can see that this is the current list, and uh, you can imagine what fun Charles and I had trying to get consensus on a framework for the 21st century learning and all the skills necessary. I think it took uh, was about two years to actually finalize the first draft, and we've been through many, many uh, modifications and updates since then. Um, so uh, the next slide actually shows the framework that uh, that came out of all that effort, and uh, we believe that this is probably one of the one of the best uh, frameworks. There's many, many variations of this framework uh, uh, around the world, and Charles, you might want to speak to that. But but this is. Uh, this is one that we feel pretty close to, and we think captures uh, the essence of both the outcomes that are necessary, what learning goals students need to have now in the rainbow part, and what uh, the education system has to deliver as far as support systems in the pools below. Um, so in the green area, you've got the, the core subjects that we all know and love, math, science, English, social studies, all the rest, but in addition, some 21st century themes that cut across those disciplines like uh, financial literacy and environmental literacy and health literacy uh, and, a, and a number of others. And then uh, surrounding that core, core content and themes um, are the three buckets of, of, uh, of skills, skill sets that have been identified, uh, the learning and innovation skills, the life and career skills, and the information media and technology skills. And to, to get those outcomes, you need a, a robust um, uh, education system that uh, is aligned with those outcomes, uh, aligned with the standards and assessments, the curriculum, the professional development, and learning environments, and that's pretty much uh, the model uh, that um, that has been uh, developed and uh, is still being tweaked a little bit, but is pretty stable right now and is uh, being used uh, throughout the U.S. And uh, I think we're up to 14 states now that have adopted this framework. To uh, correct 14. Yep. To change their uh, their education systems uh, toward this model, uh, with very various different degrees of success and speed. <laughs> uh, West Virginia, I believe, is one of the first, and they may be leading the pack because it's a small state, and they they were there early, and have had a number of years working on this. And there's there's many others that are active. Um, Charles, you want to comment on the international aspect of this, of uh, how this framework is looked at uh, elsewhere? Sure. Um, it's uh, it's quite frankly, in my opinion, and Bernie's, uh, the most comprehensive yet the most succinct framework there is. Uh, we compare this to the EU's Lisbon process. We compare this to 
uh, a number of others in the U.S., uh, NEAP, uh, IST. We also compare to national frameworks like the Soccer Coma in France and so on. This is by far the most complete and most succinct, and I insist on succinct because the practitioners, the ones who will be redoing the standards, cannot live with a list that's uh, interminable. They need a finite list that's of moderate size that is comprehensive enough to not forget items, but also succinct enough so they can actually uh, act upon it. Another important point about this framework is it's also been thought through really carefully to stay at the appropriate layer of abstraction so we don't have elements that go up and down, meaning some really down in the weeds and some you know, at the metacognitive level. And thirdly, we try to be really clear on the taxonomy and on the definitions behind um, each one of the elements of the framework. Back to you, Bernie. Okay, great. So the next slide actually uh, show, shows the list of, uh, of skills that uh, the partnership has identified as being uh, the most critical. Um, the key to it, of course, is that first box learning and innovation skills. And that is creativity and innovation, critical thinking and problem solving, and communication and collaboration. Uh, those, those really are the, the core skills for a lifelong learner, and uh, as well as a lifelong uh, innovator and inventor. <laughs> so those, those are the core, followed by the, uh, the, the new 21st century skills, the information literacy, media literacy, and ICT literacy skills, that is actually transforming how we actually learn all those other skills. Uh, giving us new opportunities uh, with technology to, to uh, apply those skills to various different content areas. And then the sort of the timeless life and career skills, things that, were, that you all mentioned uh, in the exercise of flexibility and adaptability, initiative and self-direction, social and cross-cultural skills, productivity, accountability, leadership, and responsibility. Those, those are the short list uh, that we believe uh, uh, are, are really the core of what it will take to be successful in the 21st century. Not only is a successful worker, a successful citizen, success, successful family member, um, and, uh, and all the roles that, that you play, these are, these are going to be the important, important skills. And of course, many people said, okay, these are not 21st century skills. These are 15th century and 18th century and 20th century, except for the information, media, and technology skills. Agreed. Um, these are life, lifelong skills, or, or actually uh, historical skills that, that have been important in other periods of time. But what's important now is that uh, uh, we all need these skills in order to be successful. Before it was a smaller elite group. Now everyone uh, needs these skills to be successful in, uh, in the kinds of jobs uh, that we have, uh, good jobs that we have available in the 21st century, as well as to be a good participant in making decisions, dem democratic decisions, and voting and all the rest, because things are complex now in our global flat world. Okay. Bernie, uh, it's a quick time check. It's uh, 5.39 your time. Yep. Okay. Yeah, so um, I think uh, what we'll do uh, at this point, um, let's see. I will, let's jump ahead for a second to uh, um, the, uh, the SARS slide for a second, and I want to just uh, cover uh, a little bit about how you can get these skills. So uh, if you can jump, jump me over to the... Yep, you're there. Okay, great. Thank you. Oh, it's amazing. Okay, so um, uh, one good example, and it's included in the DVD in the book, and it's also on our website uh, for the book, um, is the, uh, the SARS video. This was a, a ThinkQuest project where a number of students from five different countries um, created a website about SARS to help students understand it. Uh, and uh, prepare uh, so that the, they uh, don't don't catch it, and uh, goes into the medical aspects and the and the biological aspects of SARS. They they collaborated on this for over nine months, um, uh, all online, creating a, a wonderful website, and uh, then uh, won a great award in the ThinkQuest competition uh, for for their wonderful work. Uh, and this this uh, uh, example of a project that is both content rich um, and 21st century skills rich, I think is, is, uh, is an important uh, uh, model, at least one, for how uh, these skills can all be learned uh, in a slightly different way using a more project and pro uh, inquiry and, and a problem approach to learning. Um, and um, let's see if we can s uh, take a look at the next slide. I'll walk you through a model that kind of captures at least one of the one of the ways that you can uh, build 21st century skills into the, the learning process and, uh, and and the rest, and it was done in the SARS project, which is talked about quite a bit in the in the book. Um, 
it's based on the on a project cycle. And as we all know, projects have phases. Uh, and the, the simplest uh, definition is project has a define phase, define it, plan it phase, a do it phase, and a review it phase. And the the teacher has uh, their uh, project plan uh, for the learning project. Um, on the next slide, the students have their uh, um, project uh, um, plan, the, their, their their phases, their defined plan, do and review. Uh, next slide, they uh, have to co-manage that uh, that uh, learning experience together. So uh, we're building a little uh, bicycle here, the bicycle model of 21st century project learning. Uh, the next slide adds uh, some seats for the teacher and students. The next slide uh, is, is a really important uh, slide. It, it adds uh, the motivation for the project. And what's really essential and what has been missing in, 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 uh, in project-based learning in the past uh, in some ways is the essential question or the essential problem that that particular project is working on. In the SARS case, it was how do we help students understand SARS and prevent uh, catching it. Um, and uh, one other point I want to make here is that uh, we really have forgotten that the two most important motivators for learning are questions and problems, and we have to come back to that. We really do, and this this model uh, does put that at the at the focus of of the learning uh, equation, uh, problems and questions that that uh, steer steer this project uh, or any project, learning project into the future, and into future learning in both of skills and knowledge, and and all the rest that are necessary. The next slide shows uh, an additional thing: your learning gear and tools. That's your gear shift there. Uh, uh, will also help you if you have better gear and better tools and, uh, and good methods uh, in, in project learning. Uh, you can probably get up, get up the hill a little bit faster and learn a little bit more as you go along. The next slide shows that the importance of uh, evaluation and assessment, which is the, um, the little gauge, and doing that formatively so it's part of the learning process, not separate activity, but uh, ongoing uh, formative evaluation and assessment. Uh, and then, of course, the brakes for uh, driving and pace and time management. Um, and then, when you put this uh, this project on the road, the degree of challenge is the slope of the of the road. Could be too hard, could be too easy for the group, um, and you have to adjust. If you leave too, lean too far to the left, you may be, the teachers may be providing too much guided instruction. If you lean too far to the right, uh, there may be too much chaos and or what could be called collaborative construction <laughs> of, of of the learning. You need a good balance across that. And on uh, the next slide, if you have a, uh, a support from your school and community, you get a tailwind, which helps a whole bunch. And on the next slide, if you don't, you get a headwind. And that has often stopped many a good project. Uh, so it's important to get the support from school, community, parents, and all the rest. And then the final slide in that is the, uh, the destination, which is the, the model the, that uh, we presented earlier of uh, the partnership model for 21st century learning. So Bernie? So that's at least one model. Oh, sure, so this is a good time for me to ask my question, and, and we are getting close to where I need to make sure there's Q&A for everybody who's here, because you're you're only seeing bits and pieces as you come into the chat, but there's a lot of chat. Um, okay, so if we can go back to this slide, I'm going to go back one just for a second, um, and, and I think I'm right in, I think I'm accurate in stating that you see the need for teachers to become learners in order to be a part of this. Uh, system that there's uh, that they're going to need to be learning as much as the students in order to provide these environments. So, what's the comparable model here for teachers and those who would help the teachers? Meaning, this bicycle here, I think, represents the teacher and the students model. But isn't doesn't this need to be kind of paralleled in terms of the teachers and the administration, or the teachers and the the you know whatever regional organizations work with the teachers? Sure, professional development is absolutely critical, and uh, and the, some of the best professional development puts teachers into projects that they uh, they develop the same skills as their students are developing in the same methods, uh, and and then they're also given uh, the extra uh, be facilitators, good coaches and facilitators of that of that learning project and how to how to how to really. Uh, set the projects up well, how to support the learning, um, how to keep it on track, and how to manage through that project cycle uh, with, with the learning goals uh, in mind. Uh, so you're, you're right, the, um, teachers need to go through this experience. Uh, and actually, what was really amazing, uh, we, uh, we look at all the teachers in the ThinkQuest uh, program, I think 
currently there's about 400,000 teachers and students uh, in the environment. And we, we did some surveys a while back and, and, and wondered why teachers come into the project space, do a, do a project or two, and then leave. And their answer was, uh, we just don't have uh, enough professional development around how to sustain great learning projects. We haven't been taught in a learning project method methodology at all. Um, and we're not rewarded, we're rewarded for it. In fact, uh, in some cases, uh, we get the merits for, for veering away from the, the, the standard uh, curriculum. Um, so uh, that's, uh, it is critical that, that teachers uh, learn uh, through a similar method. And, uh, and uh, a lot of organizations are providing some of that. Oracle Education Foundation does it. Intel does it. Uh, Cisco has a has some some academy work. There's a number of academies and programs that are now helping students uh, and teachers both, uh, and primarily teachers through professional development, um, learn how to how to how to operate this kind of learning uh, methodology. So this is where I run the risk of going too deep, but I'll ask it, and we can steer away from it, joke pun intended, if we don't want to. But if in fact questions and problems are crucial to this kind of learning. And, um, and this model presents already kind of the model. Uh, uh, does it not leave room for the educators to actually kind of build and create their own models? I mean, one of the, one of the, uh, one of the quotes I really liked from um, Neil Postman was he talks about Marshall McLuhan and the use of uh, naming something. And the moment we name something complex, we we kind of put it on the shelf or we reduce it to something simple. And so I wondered if maybe part of the inherent tension of doing what you did in the book, of, of going through all these descriptions, is that in some ways teachers and educators and administrators kind of have to go through the process of arriving at these conclusions on their own, don't they? Yeah, I would agree with you. Um, uh, it, it is it is a transformational process for a teacher who who it, it, if they've been taught in a very traditional stand and deliver <laughs> methodology uh, that uh, that this is a shift and it and it does take some some experience and some practice to to move in this direction. And for the longest time, the Partnership for Twenty First Century Skills avoided talking about methods at all, teaching methods. Um, just avoided it, just for the reason that you explained. But the problem was, everyone said, "Show me, show me, show me, show me," and give us, give us something to go by. So this is another reason why Charles and I took it upon ourselves to at least begin to put some video examples of what we believed were some some valiant efforts uh, in in moving uh, the learning model in this direction. The, the model I presented is by no means the only model. There are many, many other models that that can uh, can. Uh, intertwine the 21st century skills along with the, the rich content knowledge and the 21st century themes, and uh, and 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 come out with uh, the kind of success that we're looking for with, in our in our students. So um, I, I would agree with you. Uh, although, you know, if without guidance, uh, it could take till the 22nd century, and uh, we still wouldn't have it. Well, so that's so that's what's so interesting for me about this whole um, thought process. Which is, you know, sometimes do we feel the temptation to, to guide the teachers in the same way that we're asking teachers to to not do with the students, to give them the freedom and the ability to kind of create and make mistakes and work, and so, do, you know, do we have this inherent tension and dilemma because we're a little reluctant to let teachers do that for fear they'll do something wrong? Well. Unfortunately, uh, we haven't allowed teachers to do this enough. That, that's that's the fact. Uh, it, that is changing. Uh, we do have a new administration. We do have a, a, a transformation going on. It's going to take a while. Um, but in fact, uh, th these kinds of methods uh, uh, were choked out of the system uh, for the, in the last uh, 10 years in many ways. So uh, they will return. They are coming back for all the right reasons. Um, and uh, but it, it will be a bumpy road. Well, so I have to say, I really loved reading the book. It, it was a, it was a, uh, again, I, I think I have this interview series tends to be sort of the brightest part of my week. So, uh, and I have lots more that I'm interested in talking about. But this is a really good group, and so I want to open it up for questions here, and hope that uh, that you will uh, have some questions. You can either raise your hand using the hand with the up arrow to take the microphone, uh, or if you'd like, you can put your your question in the chat. And I caught two of the many that, that went by, and I know I missed some. But an early on question was, how do librarians fit into this model? 
Oh, very much so. I, I call them the guides inside. Uh, they've been doing projects with students uh, forever, R research projects, all the rest. They are really up to speed on technology. I have total faith that uh, that they're the unsung heroes of this movement. And uh, if given uh, enough support, they could really uh, be the leadership inside schools, the guys inside for other teachers, uh, to really help them uh, move into this direction. Um, I, I've uh, presented at a, a couple different uh, library uh, association meetings, and I am convinced they're there. They, they just need some recognition, some support, and some some funding occasionally, so they can keep their jobs. Uh, but uh, they they really get this totally. They they uh, they they really live this, and they understand this uh, learning project cycle and inquiry and design as being important, and and know the resources. Uh, to uh, to help students uh, find what they what what they need in order to do uh, the research and, and the, the uncovering of knowledge and, and the rest. So um, I think they're the one of the greatest assets in the 21st century learning movement we have. I I think you you've really gratified some people in the audience. Uh, they're going to go back and listen to the recording, and I'm sure they're going to want to quote you. I think they even I think some of them. That's fine. But I think some of them, some of the librarians have fainted. I don't think they have heard this much praise in a in a while. So thank you guys. <laughs> okay. Another question that came out a yep. couple of times was, uh, if we look at the requirements for jobs, uh, Jeff says, are we just teaching to create workers? He says, just asking. Yeah. No. Can I handle this one, Bernie? That's my go, one of my. Go for it, go for it Charles. This one. Um, you know, I get this, this question quite often, particularly out of Europe, where labor movements are even stronger than in the U.S. Uh, and, uh, you know, come on, um, would we be as entities in existence if we only um, raised obedient workers? Uh, the, the world isn't there anymore. Clearly, we're, we're, we're uh, teaching citizens how to function, and the world needs more than ever before citizens who can collaborate about all sorts of issues that will um, make us all hang together if we don't solve them, such as global warming and so on and so forth. Now, that said, it is also important, particularly in this age of hyper-competition, to have an eye on employability, which in the past 30, 40, 50 years, as Western nations were becoming more prosperous, had been somewhat neglected. So it's not an either or. It's citizens and capable workers. Well, and, and in addition, in order to uh, deal with the complex problems that we have today, uh, as you mentioned, the environmental issues, uh, financial issues, uh, just about everything you can think of uh, is, is uh, in transformation right now. Uh, we need a citizenry that, that can go deep uh, into, into understanding the complexity of, of uh, our, our world situation today. And, uh, and and make the right decisions when it comes to, to voting and and, uh, and you know lobbying for for certain uh, courses of action. So I I, I think it, the same sets of skills that uh, that that to help you solve business problems are the skills that help us solve world problems and community problems and family problems and the rest. I don't think these are strictly uh, business skills at all. I think they're they're life skills and apply to uh, to much more than than just the business world. I'm watching the chat, and I'm going to have to go back and look at the chat log, which of course does get recorded and published, because there's so many good links here that I want to, to follow up with. So I want to ask a question for Jackie, who's not asking it, but I'm curious. Uh, what's the role of the student in determining their course of education? And are we going to shift gears toward more student um, as decision maker and student as uh, motivated? For their, to create their own educational course, and at what age do you think that's going to need to start happening? That's a great question. You know, I, I think the opportunities are growing. The online learning opportunities are growing uh, quickly. Um, hopefully, through uh, learning projects and the rest, students will get a sense, uh, more of a sense of what what their strengths and weaknesses are. Um, and through good guidance, um, will begin to find their passions uh, earlier on. And it, it would be an amazing transformation if, if we could really help every student uh, find their, their their passion and really support it. That's that's the probably the biggest challenge for education uh, and education and technology is to is to personalize learning uh, uh, to to the individual so that they can really go deep. I remember in uh, high school, you know, getting really excited about. 
a certain topic and you know it couldn't just couldn't go deep because there were five other subjects we had to you know you have to cover and so it, in college I actually uh, took off some time to to work on the first Earth Day <laughs> that puts me that ages me <laughs> the very first Earth Day in DC because I wanted to go deep I really cared about the environmental issue and there you know all those other subjects in in the undergraduate years who were getting in my way I wanted to really go deep so I think that is one of the biggest challenges we have but yet we have the technology we have the tools with a little work we can actually can we really can personalize and differentiate learning so that students can begin earlier on to uh, to try some things out but of course remember we're saying that uh, uh, there's going to be 11 to 14 different careers uh, by the, by age 41 uh, so the idea is, is that you, you have to, if you pick something and go deep in it, uh, the, hopefully the skills that you learn in going deep can be applied to the next area that you go into deep because there's going to be many of those in your lifetime. So is there a danger at all, and, and I guess the question is, is it a danger that, um, that it's going to be too hard for the schools to move toward that kind of individualization and that there will be uh, private uh, enterprise kind of driven opportunities for students to do that that are outside of the traditional system? Yeah, it's going to be a blend. I really do think um, there's going to be lots of opportunities that will extend the learning time in the community, uh, apprenticeships, uh, internships, um, online um, uh, courses t taken because there's, uh, there's no good teacher available in your school. Uh, for lots of different reasons, I think it's going to be a much more blended environment, but that will in turn extend the learning time, uh, which, which is really good, and help students uh, follow their, their current passions and use that motivation uh, and, and that energy to, uh, to delve into to, uh, lots of different subjects and learn them in a way that they'll remember them for the rest of their lives, as opposed to just uh, putting it back on bubbles on a test. I don't know. What do you think, Charles? Um, you've said it all. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I did want to mention that in the beginning of the book, you tell the story of the Chinese Ministry of Education visit, and it really hearkened to the Yang Zhao material. Is there a direct connection there? Have you talked to him yeah. about that? I, I, yeah, we've spoken, and uh, in fact, we exchanged a, an email just recently. And he said, uh, I think we are all part of the same body <laughs> or, or the same mind in, the same, in different bodies, I think is what he said. Uh, there's so many uh, uh, educators uh, that, that have had uh, cross-cultural experience that really get this. And it, it, and it is kind of bizarre that, uh, that uh, China, you know, is looking to the United States uh, for innovation. And uh, at the same time, the United States is looking to the Far East, like Singapore, for uh, for doing really uh, incredibly good direct instruction. <laughs> and somewhere in between, there may be some truth. Um, but uh, but in the long run, I, I, as it was said in the story, um, the United States does have a lead. It could lose it. It does have a, a very deep culture around innovation and creativity. Uh, and uh, and I think that that's an edge that we we still are holding on to, but uh, it's learnable. And, and any other country could learn how to do this. It, it, it may be more difficult given their culture uh, and their traditions, but they can be overcome over time. Uh, so it's it's uh, it, and I don't see it as a as a competition per se. I think it's a collaboration. I think you know if you look at the the business world right now, um, it's uh, it's multinational collaboration. We're collaborating across boundaries everywhere, and learning is becoming the same thing across boundaries. So. I think we all have to help each other uh, in developing these skills, and, and, and I see it less, in many ways, as a uh, as, as a competition and more than, more than a global collaboration to learn these skills and, and be successful. I would say it sure feels to me like a rising tide issue, and it, it, just these kind of events that we're doing online or the networks that teachers are joining, there's clearly a lot of collaboration happening very fast with a lot of innovation taking place. Hey, we're at an hour. I think we could all go on much longer, but I did okay. promise both of you that we would be an hour. Let me, I'm going to clap for you. Great. I think everybody here had a, okay, had a great you. time, and uh, it was sure fascinating. If you haven't read the book, I uh, would really encourage you to, to do so. Um, it does come with the actual video uh, in the back of the DVD. 
Um, thank you both, Bernie and Charles, for being here tonight. And thanks for those of you who have attended. I'll stick around for about 10 minutes to do a post show. Um, but, but Charles and Bernie, you're both welcome to leave and, and get back to things. And thank you for coming. Our pleasure. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, thanks so much. Cheers. Take care. Thank you both. Okay, so I'll stick around for about 10 minutes to see if we want to do any kind of post show. Um, I, I'm, I'm glad there was some positive comment back with regard to you know, the question of um, providing teachers with the same opportunities to, to do the project based in the learning uh, as well as the students. So I'd be interested in drilling down on that or anything else that you want to talk more about. So feel free to raise your hand. I'll give you the mic. Or you can just put your note in the chat. So Carolyn, the uh, chat log will be on the futureofeducation.com site. So when you click later tonight or tomorrow into the show, it will actually have a link for the chat log, as well as the full recording and the MP3 version. And the MP3 will go into the podcast stream. Oh, sorry, is my mic cutting out? Anyway, futureofeducation.com. By tomorrow morning, you should have the full stream, the full ability to look at that. So there hasn't been any sound because I haven't said anything. So Carol came in late. Yep, you're most welcome. Um, this was really a fun one. And I think that there were a lot of people in the in the chat mentioning how grateful they were to be able to, to save this and show it to other people. So I hope you'll do that. OK, it looks like we were probably wrapping up here. Don't see any additional questions coming in. Better than Letterman. <laughs> Thank you. Although Yang Zhao told me that he didn't think I would make it on Fox Network, so I've been sufficiently humbled. He was making a point about the, our ability to do things where we aren't professionals, which was which was nice and uh, thoughtful. But at, at the same time, indicating that that I am able to do this even not being a professional wasn't. I smiled as I heard it. So Tom's asking an interesting question. Does anyone have a concern with individuals concentrated learning too early, like athletes taken from their families early? Well, Tom, I wonder also as well, this is, there's always been a small percentage of students who were self-motivated and very interested in the kind of learning that now is, is becoming much broader. So as, that, as the requirements go deeper into the student pool for this kind of learning, what will happen to the students for whom this is just not their way of being? You know, the student who, who, who does well at um, being a mechanic or being a park ranger and is not as interested in the, these skills. And so I worry a little bit about what the change will do to those particular learners. Oh, it looks like there's another show coming on or has started already at Teachers Teaching Teachers. So I sure want to encourage you to go there if um, Peggy's putting the links there. OK, so I think we'll wrap up here so you can go to that show. Uh, in order for the recording to process, I do have to have everybody exit the room. So go ahead and go up to uh, file and exit or close the window down. And if you don't leave in a minute or so, I'll, I'll actually close the room. So thanks again for coming. That was a great show. And uh, great appreciations to, to Bernie and Charles for their good work.